Steve Jordan is one of the greatest, most prolific drummers of our time and arguably of all time. But what exactly can we learn from him, not just from his drumming, but interviews, observing how he approaches music? That's what I want to talk about. First thing I learned from Steve Jordan is to live in the pocket. Now it's one thing to play pocket or time, it's one thing to play a drum beat. It's another to live completely in that pocket. And I'm not talking about you always have to just play the groove. I'm talking about when you go to play a drum fill, when you go to play a solo, when you play a drum beat, you are embodying, you are living in the pocket. Every note that you play has meaning, and every note that you play is in the pocket 100%. This next one's really important. It's be a lover of music and drumming. So if you listen to Steve talk, he always is talking about his influences. He's talking about this recording he heard. He's comparing them. The greatest drummers of all time, and it's a deep influence on my playing. He played drums on It's Your Thing, and actually influenced the landscape of pop music. And the thing that really shines through is he just loves music. And really, we have to deep down just be lovers of music, not just lovers of drums, but lovers of the music that we play because in doing that, we can convey that music effectively. This next thing he said in an interview, and it really struck me, and, and it's the distance between two notes can be an ocean. Start to hone the definition of what a quarter note is, then you can see how wide a quarter note can be. The distance between two notes can be an ocean. It's kind of like once you really get into it and really start to focus on it, it's kind of like you can get into a zone. He was speaking about when he was a timpani player, you mute the drums so you do very much understand what a quarter note is, how much time you need to give that quarter note. Oftentimes, as drum set players, we're not always muting and unmuting, so the notes start to run together. But he was talking about the distance between two notes can be so wide and how we treat that distance really has to, uh, to do with how the groove is interpreted. I've told my students for years, we all try to play the black ink on the page, but we very rarely try to play the white space in between that ink. And the thing is, is there's oftentimes much more white space in between the notes or the black ink on a page. So be sure to understand that the space between two notes it can be an ocean. I've got something really exciting to tell you. I'm pumped about it. These are so much fun for me and for the people that attend. So registration for the 2024 SDS camp season is open now. Now last year, these sold out. I sent out a couple of emails and in two weeks, they were completely sold out waiting list only. Jump to the link in the, in the video description. All of the information is at the link below. Do not wait around. Hopefully I'll see you here at the SDS studios in 2024. And then this one was really important in my development and that is know the song first. First, then write the part. You know, what beat am I gonna play on this song, whatever. He said, well, you haven't even heard the song yet. And you're starting to trying to figure out what beat you're gonna play on it. That's like the most unmusical thing that you could do, which is why there's so many drummer jokes. So once I realized that that was completely ridiculous, I just play the song first. So all too often as drummers, we try to just jump in with whatever part is being played. And we all too often forget like, hey, you know, there's a song here. We can't just think of this in terms of drum beats. We have to think of this in terms of songs. And so if we learn the song first and then later come back and start creating drum beats to it, we are playing the music and not just some beat that we're trying to force into the music. So anytime you're writing for a song, listen to the song and stop playing for a few minutes. Listen and try to embody that song, understand the history of that song. Love that song enough that you want to write a part that complements what the songwriter was doing. Don't just jump in after two measures and start trying to play along with it. You haven't heard the song yet. When they think of hooks, they think of guitar hooks, melodies and everything like that. But Charlie played a lot of drum hooks. He did. 
And if you don't play them, you're not playing the song, in my opinion. This one everybody references when they reference Steve Jordan playing. He becomes the groove, like he internalizes the groove. You can see it all over his face. His body is moving with it. Just put it on mute and watch Steve Jordan play a drum beat. He internalizes everything. His body's moving with it. He's dancing with that. And to me, it's playing with that conviction of understanding I know exactly where this groove needs to lay. I know exactly what needs to be done. And I need to uh, convey that not only through the sound, but visually I need to, I need to really become this part and not just, you know, not just phone it in, not just kind of fake my way through it. Quick interlude, this is a late 70s Slingerland copper over wood kit. They only made them for one year because they found out the coating they put on the copper actually didn't keep it from corroding. A student of mine gifted this to his studio so I had a local artist put his impression on the bass drum head and it's now affectionately called the mom. This one took me a long time and far too many years to learn and a lot of players I talk to, it, it's similar. Don't be afraid to admit your mistakes. You need to have an honest assessment of your playing, whether it be good or bad. And we're not always looking for mistakes. We're just looking for quality. What's quality there? Call that quality out. And then if it's not quality, you have gotta be willing to call that out as well. Steve was talking in a, I believe it was a reverb interview that he did. And he was talking about whenever he played with the Blues Brothers, that he, they had a, a cover, a song that went to um, number one. It was a cover of Soul Man. I can't listen to it because it's scary. It's frightening, you know? It's like I played way too much. The tempos are way too fast. Everything is just like, whoa. If you listen to our version of Soul Man, which was no, went, went to number one, I remember the first time I heard the original after we did our version, I almost had a nervous breakdown. That's a perfect example of something that is timeless. If you put Soul Man on right now, it's one of the baddest things you'll ever hear. If you heard, put our version on, I'm going, you know, because that was, you know, hip at the time and everything like that. Believe me, that ain't working. This one, a lot of students don't do, and I have to talk them through it. And that is do your research on the gig. So if you want to get a gig, it is not enough to simply learn the music. My approach to playing this stuff is being a record fanatic that I am, I'm going to bring back some of the things from the original recording. So I did my due diligence and looked at certain periods of time. From 71 to 75, the band was extremely hot. They were on fire. So, and that's why I'm using the kit that I'm using because it harkens back to that period. And, but I'm using, you know, the one time, and he only had two cymbals on the right side. He didn't have anything on the left side. Ah. And so I don't have anything on the left side. So I have a direct eye contact with Keith. I referenced some of that period live as well and bringing some of that to the party. So it's a combination of those two elements. There. Sure. And then some of my personality of what I would like to hear. That's not sacrilege. You know, right, you know, right, you know. right. That's the first step. That's like, yeah, we're obviously gonna do that because we're musicians and we have to do that to play the gig. What you have to do is you have to learn the history of the gig. So what that entails is not just learning the songs you'll be playing that night, go back and listen to their other albums, go back and see their other live shows, compare that to what they're doing now. Now, look at the other players in that genre. Who are they playing with? Who's opening for them or who are they opening for? Who are their influences? Ask all of these things and then we use this as information whenever we're playing so that we can represent the music authentically but also bring some of our originality to it and we can't do that unless we thoroughly immerse ourselves in the style of music so whenever you're learning music for a gig for instance the gig that I'm on right now I spend a lot of time learning the music I also spend a lot of time listening in my car while I'm mowing the grass to past albums influences of them bands I'd never listened to that maybe I I needed to check out because all of that helped to influence my playing in that gig. 